Hey, Sam, it's amazing coming from those days, the throwback there, and now you're an acting CISO for the Department of Customer Service in New South Wales. So it's really awesome to be crossing paths again, of course, but super keen to know all about your experiences today. But do you want to kick off perhaps with how your experiences in your former life as a military officer have shaped the cybersecurity leader that you are today? Yeah. Sure. So, and as you know, we join, um, you join as an officer, you go down to RMC Duntru and you've got 18 months of leadership management and strategic operational planning. And you don't think, you don't think twice that you're just there in the zone, you're going through that after 18 months. And then it really hits you when you do step out into the real army and, and you're now the team leader of a 30 plus team. They're full of guys and girls with years of experience. Um, and then you're supposed to be the, you know, the leader that's taking them and turning their direction and guidance. So I was just reflecting on that and I was like, I think what really makes it is those soft skills, but the ones that they, you sort of touch on it, done true and you do your, your leadership and management training and you do all that sort of activities, but it's how you become effective, you know, in that environment where you're the new guy or girl and, you know, they're looking up to you for guidance, direction and leadership. You've got zero experience and you look about 20. So like, you don't have to worry about shaving every day because you don't grow a beard anyway. <laughs> so I think just that and that, that dynamic, like really shapes and has shaped me, particularly coming now into more senior roles in private and public sector, where I've had a good 10 or so years really refining those leadership skills and, and working on those soft skills. And generally, you know, if you do it the other way, you start off at uni or you go into a tech career, you then over time and experience build up your team skills, leadership experience. And then by the time you're a sizer, you've done every role from architect, consultant, team leader, all the way up to those roles. But I think that's a real, um, it's a really, it's a really good, you go know, credit and it's a good skill set that veterans bring. I did, just, I'm talking about officers, but also the other streams in Army are junior NCOs. I mean, from day one at Kapuka, they're taught leadership management, look after yourselves, look after your team members. They run small teams. You have up to 12 people. So these are just everywhere. And that's, and that's something that veterans bring to every organization. Also, it's something that's really hard to put on a CV and it's really hard to sell, but you see it play out in organizations. When I was at Westpac, there was a big group of ex-vets and reservists. And if you wanted to get shit done, you know how to spoke to, and it was all those people. Funnily enough, the majority of them were in security and she got done. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Got a good testament to both of the gents that I get to share this virtual room with right now. In both examples, Sam, so absolutely. Go the veterans in cyber, I say. And what about the, talk to us about the translation from Signals Corps specifically as it relates to being in the cybersecurity industry. Yeah, so Signals Corps, as, a, as an officer in Signals Corps, you've got, uh, you're responsible for like the full suite of technology. So it's everything from green RF, right, radio communications and the tactical military stuff, satellites through to ICT computers. At the start of my career, and Ben can attest to this, security was just another thing that you didn't really, no one really cared about. And you just tick the box, whatever. But I think later, later in, in defense, when it finally caught up and was taking it really seriously, it became another big piece of the signals portfolio. So yeah, I started off you know, just as basically an ICT service delivery manager, rolling out technology. I was fortunate enough in the early days to deploy over to Afghanistan. And for some reason, they made me the, the J6, which is basically the regional CIO or equivalent. So I was responsible for all communications in Afghanistan. And you didn't and stuff it up, Sam? I don't know. I didn't get to him <laughs> early, so. Oh, that's a good sign. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's actually a funny story. We were, because obviously at that time when I went over there, we were consolidating all our, our bases into, into Kabul or around Kabul. And because the fighting had been out in those provinces for most of the war, there wasn't much infrastructure to support tactical maneuver within Kabul. 
So I thought, yep, you know what? I'm going to solve this problem. I'm a really smart young guy. That's what he's doing. <laughs> so anyway, we designed a repeated tower. So communications tower, we're going to go put it on the highest hill in Afghanistan so that we, sorry, in Kabul, so they can get full coverage across the city. And I'm going to look like a hero and everyone's going to love me. <laughs> So, you know, do all those things, recon, build the gear, good to go. The team's built the gear. So firstly, I was like, yep. And you know what? I'm a you know, brand new captain. I'm going to lead this mission out. So I've got the, it's the infantry, the infantry platoon and their PMVs. We go out into Kabul city, navigating our way from the base, which is the airport, all the way up to TV Hill. It's going all great. And then, uh, you know, I'm like, oh yeah, this is the street we turned down. Down we go here, guys. Turn down the street and lo and behold, it's market day in wherever town part of Kabul we were. And there's probably like 15,000 people. There's so many. They just turned and looked at us and then we we're like, oh my God, what have we done? <laughs> so we just pushed on going at probably like, you know, crawling pace, plowing our way through a crowd. Everyone's like getting out, yelling at us, like, so sorry, let us through. <laughs> so we made it past that obstacle. Uh, and then when we're going up the hill, the track is a bit of a goat track. So anyway, I was like, oh, yeah, I'm going to jump out the front and I'll lead the vehicles up on foot. So we sort of got up to the top there. I didn't know, but lots of people live up there. So it's just like this hill and there's, all, and I watch here a photo, there's just all these TV antennas. And it's just crazy. Um, but people actually come up there as well. So we're going up there with our vehicles, obviously armed with the weapons and everything. Uh, and I didn't see this massive power line that's sort of drooping a little bit too low. And then, you know, we didn't want to look too offensive as we were walking up the hill. So the gunners, you know, put their, raised their guns up into the, the air. But. As I was walking out front, I didn't see the power line. Neither did the guys in the PMV. If <laughs> we took you out the power line. Oh, no. <laughs> so, so from hero to zero. Actually. Hero to zero. <laughs> um, eyes. And then we anyway, got up there, did the thing. And next minute I've got this town that effectively lives up on the hill, all up in arms. Like, you've taken out our power. What have you done? The interpreters there, like, what have you done? You've taken out their power line. So they're trying to negotiate. They're like, give us money. We want this. We want that. We went back and forth for a good 20 minutes with the translator. Eventually we got to it saying, they just said to us, do you have any duct tape? Or like stick? And I'm like, yes, we've got plenty of that. So I hey, them with a couple of rolls. And then we went up on our stuff. And I'm like, I'll show the translator, mate. Let me know if they need anything else. So I look back and then there's three or four guys. They've jibbed themselves up the pole. One's got the power line. Ian is holding it there and they're just wrapping it with the duct tape to get the You're power joking. on. joking. <laughs> the best part about that whole thing is the duct tape is probably still today holding that power line together. <laughs> oh, it was, it was like, I was like, oh my God, like, what have I done? We've put us down this one-way street full of thousands of people and ruined someone's power. And anyway, the, the best part of the story is the thing didn't even work because the equipment failed. So we had to go such <laughs> <laughs> that's like a triple whammy. <laughs> yeah. You yep. got to send me that photo, Sam, of what it looked like. It's really yeah, good too. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah for the good fish, I'll do it. Yeah. Nice. <laughs> what a foray into being practically the CIO of that deployment. It's just like, yes. oh dear. <laughs> yeah. It gets cold it's on top of that hill too. Just it does. Very cold. <laughs> yeah. Crazy. <laughs> oh, ben dear. knows the, you, you know the hill, Ben. Yeah, I know, I know intimately. I had a few faux pas up on that hill myself. <laughs> they, sh they shall remain anonymous though. <laughs> Did you try the goat the front that the guards have up there? That was yeah. disgusting. Yeah, I had to, that was one of my faux pas. I had some of the bread up there and <laughs> uh, yeah, it didn't end well as in, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. always wash yeah. it down with a full strength coke. Yeah, full strength <laughs> something. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Oh dear. So you mentioned, Sam, you mentioned the, the lack of security early on in your career in the military. And as you mentioned, I can attest to that password one with a capital P was the password of choice across some systems that probably shouldn't have had that, but it evolved over time. And towards the back end of your career, you would have seen the importance and significance of cybersecurity, especially being rolled out across the fleet of the Signals Corps. And we've now seen a tri-service 
PCN, which is an employment category number for a role specifically within cyber. Talk through the importance of that and, and then how that transition then enabled you to step into your civilian role now. Yeah. Yeah. So I think by the time we started taking it really seriously, I was in so uh, special operations command and we're working with the highly sensitive systems, which were governed and managed by the same Australian signals directorate. So that had some tight compliance requirements on that. And then from that, I think that's where we just evolved as a organization that we need to take this across seriously across all of our platforms. And initially we, you know, we did what we could with the people that we had. So we up-trained, you know, the geeks as we call them, but basically the IT guys and the technicians, which were our infrastructure networking guys and girls, they were all upskilled in, in security functions and requirements. And then from there, we just added it to our portfolio of other things that we did. Where it really sort of took off for me, when I deployed on Okra to Iraq, we got to do some really good work with ASD and particularly in terms of the offensive stuff in cyber stuff and seeing those effects on the adversary that were against in, in Iraq really got me interested in that type of approach. And then from there, it just evolved into extended capabilities and supporting the defensive side on our systems. And when you look at it, I mean, it was just basically at that time, hygiene and hygiene and compliance, patching that no one likes, you know, those basic physical security requirements as well to systems. So really that formed my view and really got me interested in into cyber and from there, did some, did some study and came back to Sydney, still at 126 Commando 6 Squadron and took on a, um, sort of like a network operations center, security operations center for the East coast for the region. And I had a really, really good team there. And that's when we started to take it really seriously. You know, we, we built out a same platform. We were actually doing incident response to activities. Um, a lot of them were physical, um, Issues where, you know, there'd been some sort of lack security on a network or infrastructure device and we detected some sort of activity on there. There's a, there's a good story. I'll keep it brief, but we had, there was a visiting people from some other location and lo and behold, we were sitting up in a briefing room and, and we got this alert that came through and a device had tried to establish a DHCP connection and retrieve an IP address. Um, so that sent everyone off into full response mode. Uh, anyway, we go through our process and procedure. We managed to like locate which room, which floor, which terminal that had come from. And it just ended up being, uh, you know, one of these guys wanted to charge his iPhone, but because it was from a different country and had all the markings of an incident. So sent the alarm bells off going, but that was quite funny. Yes. Yeah, so that was pretty much it, it for military in terms of where we got to with cyber. Yeah. What, what inspired you to transition out, Sam, at the time? You went into Westpac as a senior manager, right? And then now into your current, well, your role yep. as security operations director? Yep. So I finished up, lucky, I sort of finished up in at 126, the six squadron there, uh, and it ticked all the boxes I wanted to in my army career. You're like, I've done a lot of good things, a lot of exciting things. And then unfortunately, I got sent to the, the health brigade so where they look after hospitals and those sorts of activities the role that i got wasn't really what i wanted to do anymore we got hit with covid and the bushfires so that ruined christmas and i decided look it's time for me to do something different and when leaving you know i wanted to i wanted a, a role where i could sit sorry not technically hands-on um but not sort of too far away from the technology that I'm lost in from it. So I did a lot of research and found that like a first line tech risk, cyber risk was probably where I wanted to go. And that would be a good transition point. I'm super glad I did do that because it, it gave me that good blend of understanding private enterprise and organizations, particularly in the financial sector with Westpac. At the time, there was the Royal Commission outcomes and then the enforceable undertaking from APRA in regards to the money laundering incident. So there's a lot of regulatory activity going on there and being in risk, I got exposure to all that, all the way up to sort of those higher board levels, right down to the technical teams delivering them day to day. 
And I was fortunate enough to work with the information security group, which is Westpac cyber team, working with their CISO, Richard Johnson, who was really eye-opening because they're probably the, the best cyber team in Australia, New Zealand. Um, they're, they're, they're really leading and they got exposed to, to how good they are. Yeah. Awesome. And has that, did that inspire you to climb the ranks up into, like, do you want to become a, a CISO? Yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. Well, well. Now I'm close. Here. Yeah. <laughs> How good is that? I'm on, I'm on the um, trial period. Trial before you buy. <laughs> yeah. So for, I think we're, we've got some interesting timing here, but you're, you've just moved across into the acting CISO role for Department of Customer Service, New South Wales, Sam. So congrats on that. Big Thanks. feat. In record time too, coming out of army, can I say? Yeah. Yeah. Just everything happens for a reason. So it's get it's getting shit done to what yep. you said before. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Love it. That's cool. I, I am really keen to learn a little bit more about the threat modeling piece and mm. your views on that and how you see particularly intertwining things like proactive defense into your methodology and philosophy as an acting CISO now. Do you want to take us through yeah. that, Sam? Yeah. One of the things that I've brought from my Simon the military is the threat focus and the threat centric focus that we have. Everything that is done in military planning is always about the threat. We analyze the threat. We want to know exactly what the threat's doing. We do analysis, predict what's going to happen and what the threat's going to do based upon, um, like analysis of ourselves and our own force, the environment, and then what their likely objectives, um, objectives are. And one thing that I noticed, particularly with threat intelligence coming into cyber is that we had and we've got all this good information. We've got all these really good little pieces. You know, we've got the MITRE attack framework that maps out TTPs. We've got a good database of all the threat actors out there. We can profile them. But one thing that we don't do is then model that and plan that out. So if you were to go to an organization and say, what are the threats you're facing? What are they going to do to your systems? People say things like ransomware attack. That'll happen. I'll be impacted by ransomware. Yep, a state-based actor could come and attack me. But what does that actually look like? What does the course of action lay out and look like for that organization? And, and then how can they, you know, do activities that actually treat what the threat actor is going to do? So it's where threat modeling, it comes into it. And I know this is done in the AppSec space a lot. And it's very much a similar concept, but doing this sort of at that theoretical strategic level where you, you know, do some analysis from you of your own organization, understand why and who would want to target you when you've done that, you then look at those organizations based upon some of those targeting or threats that exist and look at the TTPs that they've exploited that are documented, you know, within MITRE and other frameworks. And you actually model that out about what an attack would look like. So you're developing a course of action from reconnaissance all the way to through actions on objective and data exfiltration, if that's the attack pass that you're doing. And what that does is it helps tell that story. You get to see where your greatest weaknesses are and what the likely path that a threat actor would take. If you're doing that, you do, you do two of them. You do a most dangerous. So this is the worst case. So like everything's real bad. There's, there's the worst things happened. They've done everything that they could possibly do. Everything's failed. They've gone undetected. Put out the worst case. And then you do the most likely, which is, okay, based upon my environment and my controls, how I would respond, this is what likely would happen. And what do you get is two sort of, you know, different events or courses of action or hooks that the threat actor would do. Um, and that gives you the sort of the far right and the far left. And what usually generally happens is there's either a blend of those PTPs and activities, all those courses of action actually play out. But what you've done there is you've assessed that, that broad spectrum. So you can really understand from what I would likely see versus what is the worst thing that could happen. So much military jargon in there as well, isn't there? Like how, how so many nice. things? No, 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 I actually really like it. I don't, don't apologize at all, but just most likely course of action, most dangerous, left and right of arc. The, just throw back to the chutes and lean into individual. the hill and let the hill do the work for you. Yeah, yeah the, the old eye map. It's all in there. It's great. But like how transformative that is to bring over into the corporate domain. Sam I was only, ben. sorry, Gabe, just quick. I was only just talking about most likely course of action, most dangerous course of action as a hypothesis waiting. 
in threat modeling. I think it's really important and I, it's very military to Gabe's point, but there's such crossover into cybersecurity on the civilian street that it needs to be more prominent as a most likely hypothesis and a most dangerous hypothesis. Having those two to be able to be the equation of the sum, which is your threat modeling is very powerful because then you've got essentially a mission statement to protect against in both courses of action. Yep. hundred percent. And uh, what I've found it also, once you've documented that and you, you write out your statement. So you write it, like you said, a hypothesis, you write out what that would look like step by step. And you really then hone in on weaknesses in your environment. So finally we were doing ours just before the Optus breach occurred. And that scenario is what we played out or parts of that scenario is what we played out is our most dangerous. So then when we saw that come to fruition, we were like, okay, this is actually a really good thing to do because look, it just happened for them that we've identified those, those similar sort of paths that the threat actor would take. Would you take that threat modeling into things like tabletop exercises, Sam, and then even into things like the proactive defense disruptions? Yes. And, yeah. Yeah, hundred percent. So what we've, what with that threat modeling, you can do a lot of things. I think first and foremost, it then bundles your threat intelligence. So, you know, your threat actor, you know what they're going to do or what they're likely going to do. You can then look for those specific TTPs across your environment. It actually shapes your threat hunting. You know, I'm looking for this threat actor that's going to be doing these chain of activities to target this. It really defines that for you and, you know, it shapes those activities. So rather than just going, yeah, you know, I look for this TTP from this threat actor, it's actually an assessed and informed activity. It also shapes your incident response in your playbooks. So one thing we've done from that threat model is now develop specific incident response plans and playbooks that treat those causes of action. So use it, utilizing MITRE Defend as countermeasures as well. We, we've built up those playbooks that treat those courses of action. So if we hit a use case that says to us, you know, like a, an indicator and warning, yep, these are things that we're seeing that we assess are part of our most dangerous course of action or our most likely hypothesis, we can then pull out that playbook and respond to that and sort of take that incident response away from reacting to what the adversary is doing to actually seeing and then planning and anticipating those activities and then potentially moving to conduct activity to stop that from occurring before they get there. Sam, how often should, and I know that folks listening will think of this as well, and in the military we used to do it quite often, but if your recommendation, how often should you review those hypotheses being the most likely and most dangerous and shift the hypothesis to a new ta technique, tactic, or procedure based on the current market trend? That's a good question. We're sort of doing it quarterly at the moment. I think um, overall, your general high level strategic threats probably won't change that often. So, you know, depending upon you, the industry that you're in and what you're servicing, you're going to have a likely big threat. So for example, government is most likely going to be targeted by a state-based actor. And then, you know, if, if there is a ransomware attack, it's more likely incidental or opportunistic. So that can sort of help shape those higher levels. In terms of reviewing the courses of action, quarterly is generally is something that we can do, but keen to hear what you think, Ben, because it sounds like something that you've been thinking about as well. Yeah, I, I agree. I think quarterly is, I would say that's the minimum. Uh, I agree to your point that you, know, you shouldn't be changing your highest priorities, but in saying that, it's, a, it's an evolving landscape and the threats are consistently changing. So you've got to make sure that your most dangerous course of action is updated regularly enough that it is in line with the current market trend so that you're consistently prepared for the worst case scenario. Gabe, what are your thoughts? Don't ask me, guys. I'm a sapper. I'll just build things and blow it up. <laughs> just dip it. <laughs> Aren't you in cyber? <laughs> I'm in cyber now. Yeah, that's right. Blowing cyber up. things up. <laughs> Still building things and blowing them up, Sam. That's... <laughs> No, I think the quarterly review is pretty frequent. I would be surprised if on, that on a cadence is followed through across the board on most organizations, because I think it's quite a pioneering assessment that you do, Sam. Um, yeah, well, not... like, you know, we've only done it once. The plan is to do it quarterly. Yeah. Um, 
And yeah, it's a new thing and it's, it's not something that you can go get a third party in to do either. Like we've, a lot of people go in, you go get a big four consultancy to come in, do a threat risk and controls assessment for me. The threats you get are not generic, but they're not tailored to your organization and they don't account for that concept where we're looking at, you know, this hypothesis of most dangerous and most likely. Um, so it still doesn't give you that, okay, what's the actual playbook or what's the actual scenario going to look like for me? Um, so that thing is a new concept. I'm going to do a pitch here for my CyberCon speech or presentation that I've got in March. So I'll be talking about a little bit about that threat modeling down there, the talks called a view from the dark side for operationalizing the threat intelligence. Um, so we talk about putting those concepts that we sort of just discussed into play nice. and how you can basically pick that up and run with it. Awesome. Is that CyberCon Canberra in March, Sam? Yeah. Great. Yeah. Awesome. Big I shout will be out. there and I'll be in the audience taking notes. Yeah, that's good. Great. We'll have to link it. Your own haggles. Well. Yeah. <laughs> we'll time the release of the episode too, so we can coincide and draw, point some audience towards it. Yeah. It'd be good. For sure. Hey, Sam, what's next once you develop that strategy? You've developed your most likely, your most dangerous course of action. Uh, is it tabletop exercises? I know you mentioned playbooks. That would be the natural next progression. But from there, is it tabletops? Is it making people aware? What's the procedures that, that you developed and you find best for the next step? Yep. Yeah, so we turn and look focus at the security team. So it's building out those incident response playbooks, um, tutoring our use case detection logic through our scene to look for change of those chains of those TTPs and any indicators that would tell us that those courses of action are playing out. And then focus in our security control uplift. So as an example, API was one of the and at the API environment was one of the vulnerable points we identified in the most dangerous course of action. So now we're going out and where we can put a protective control in, we're putting that in. If not, we're either put into detective or corrective control. So it really shapes and it's been shaping the way we go about prioritizing our security. The other thing, and Gabe sort of touched on before, is the proactive defense. And it's a proactive defense is an old concept. But it, and I want to take back to the military days, it comes out of information warfare, but it's where you're shaping the adversary. So then once you understand what they're going to do and what you think that they're going to do, you can then shape them. A lot of people use a threat intelligence platform where basically they put out a honeypot or a similar infrastructure to their own and then let that get attacked and see those TTPs. And that's a form of proactive defense. But once you've done that threat modeling and assessment, you can actually understand and what you're looking for and, and whether or not what you're seeing on that threat intelligence platform feeds your hypothesis. And if it is those threat actors playing out. So that's one, one mechanism of, of proactive defense. But I think also understand, once you understand the threat, you know, what's going to happen, you know, you've assessed and you think, you know, what's likely going to happen based upon your assessment, nothing's ever a purist, but you can go out then and then do things and activities related to that. Um, whether it's, you know, if you think that okay, the threat actor is going to compromise X, Y sort of domain. They're going to try and spoof um, X, Y, Z to gain access to my users through phishing. You can go out and conduct activities where you're actually actively looking for those things and preventing the threat actor from getting that initial foothold as part of your course of action. Be remiss of me not to mention episode 28, Dark Mode with Richard Bird, who is one of the leading uh, SLISOs for API security. So if anyone is interested in dialing back to episode 28, Richard Burr is another one to listen to. As Sam mentions, the importance of the uh, API, especially as, as your most dangerous course of action. So just a shout out to that episode for anyone that wants to dial back and listen to API security and, and why it's so important in today's realm. Sam, your views on cyber engagement, it probably gives us a bit of a teaser into your leadership philosophy as well as a CISO, but um, your views on what was it being a disruptor versus being a builder as that relates to industry engagement? Yeah. Yeah. I think I've seen this play out when I joined the department, my role, not the size of our role, but actually the size of our role and my role were just created. Obviously the 2020 service New South Wales breach had occurred. The department went through a, a really big review, um, and invested in, in cybersecurity creating um, the, the CISO team. And I think from the experiences from that, I found that 
you know, off the bat, you can use that disruptor style where you are basically the bulldozer. Um, you know, we've just been impacted. This is what's happened and we need to fix these things. And you, you can use that disruptor style to get where you need to do and you get things done really quick. And that's what's happened for us. So massive uplift, being able to trailblaze, get things done, the funding's there, the support's there. But going forward, you know, you've probably, I've probably burnt and we've probably burnt all those, all the capital related to that. So now it needs to change into that, that builder and partner model where we work with the business and we can accept a bit more risk in terms of our decisions, but we're not, you know, rapidly fixing all the bleeding that had previously occurred. And I saw this, this play out at Westbrook, you know, their teams, Richard Johnson's their side has been there from the beginning and they're really a trustworthy and relied upon organization. They're a partner and they're a leader. So I think that's really something that you need to strive to. But then again, you know, if you look at um, an internet that occurs, and I imagine this is what's happening now in Medibank and Optus, they're in disruptor mode. We just need to get things done and, and harden it up. In terms of my philosophy and going forward, it's probably going to be a, a bit of both. But I think now yeah, it sort of depends on the maturity of your organization. And, you know, it, once you're at that level where you're comfortable that um, that knowledge and everyone understands the level and what cyber is and how they can deliver that, then you can sort of switch those partnering models. There was a really great point I saw from a site so I follow on LinkedIn. And he was saying, his approach when he came into the organization was to like set a six monthly vision once he started learning the organization. And then at that point, he forecasted a year forward and probably even switched tack between disruptor versus build a partner. And then at that um, 18 month mark, then set like a three year strategy. Sounded very iterative. And I really liked that approach because I'm sure it would be difficult to come in. And we even learned this as officers as well, Sam, you don't want to come in and just change the world immediately. So I think that iterative approach is really astute and probably really level-headed and you've got to take in a myriad of factors, look at the maturity, look at the, look at the capabilities and then, and sort of set the compass from there. Yeah. And the landscape is changing so much, like technology is changing rapidly, the threat's changing. And if you set your three-year strategy and it's static in, you know, six months, it's going to be irrelevant. So I think, um, you know, keeping that in mind and particularly with the technology choices and platform choices that you make in that strategy is really key as well. Hey, Sam, we talked about the known threats, the current and threat modeling. How do you see protecting information and data against the actions of the cyber threats, the adversaries, malicious actors evolving post today in the future? Oh, it could be, uh, look through the crystal ball me. I love a good gypsy. <laughs> Tell us your prediction, Sam. We're here for it. <laughs> well, let me, uh, uh, what I see is um, prioritization. Like it, you can look at, you see how everything's developed and where it's come from over the last few years. It's always been a battle between a new technology that's been exploited and then something to counter that and so on and so forth. We just keep going. And you see the fatigue that has come across everyone in the infosec industry. There's so many names about it. We laugh about it, but it's true. Look at Christmas, you look at all those breaks that generally people enjoy, and there's usually some sort of cyber event around that. So taking that into account, the fact that vulnerabilities each year are exponentially increasing in the numbers that have been released, it's going to come down, I think, to prioritization. So, and then changing of the strategy or the approach of organizations to be cyber defensive and be more so cyber resilient, be able to take a hit, absorb the hit, rise the impact of that hit and continue on. That and understanding the threat will help prioritize where you spend your money and time and effort. Couldn't go an episode around DCS without mentioning a pretty digitally savvy minister, Sam, in Victor <laughs> Dominello. He's a uh, very prominently, I would say, particularly communicating advancing technology and that digital footprint for, for the department in the general public. Do, do you see that as a security leader for the organization as something you need to be sort of in lockstep with? Does it influence your decision-making? Do you want to be seen as that trusted, you know, you want to be secure as much as digital first? Yeah. Yeah, for sure. A yeah, really good vision. And if you look at New South Wales in compared 
oh, I'm going to be a competitive year. If you look at New South Wales and compared to the other states, <laughs> bounds ahead in the capability that we've delivered to the citizens. Um, you know, just the, the service New South Wales app is that central hub of everything you need for government. And the things that we're pushing ahead with is uh, the digital birth certificate and other digital digital services. The in terms of security, I think that the department itself, our leadership, all the way up to the minister, really understand security and the importance of security and protecting the data of our citizens. So all the decisions that are made always consider that as a top priority. Our architecture, our designs, our platforms all go through a, a massive security review process that we are all part of. So it's really a top priority for us in, in the department and getting that balance between um, being supportive. I think Ben's got a bit of a story though. Yeah, I was just going to, so I moved from New South Wales to Queensland at the end of last, no, start of last year. Wow, it's been over 12 months. Uh, and you talk about being leaps and bounds ahead. Uh, I had New South Wales digital driver's license come to Queensland, uh, bought a property and needed to transition my license across to Queensland, went into the Queensland RTA, showed them my digital license. The lady looked at me like I was an alien <laughs> and she said, no, I need your license. I said, well, this is my license. She said, no, I need your license. I need to photocopy. I was like, well, how about I screenshot an email to you? She goes, no, that won't work. I need the real copy. Yep. That just goes to show how far ahead New South Wales is in the digital realm. Backs up the competitiveness there, Sam. I think it's a fair shout. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's yep. great. Yeah, right. I didn't, I didn't, really that, didn't know how to handle that situation. I was locked in the RTA. <laughs> what that did wise. you do? Did you go find a printer or something and print it? No, I had to ask for someone that was digital savvy that was under the age of 60. <laughs> <laughs> so just, their eyes glaze over sometimes. Like I can imagine in that scenario and like throwing and throwing the phone up. And they're just like, this is, this is, I'm not computing. Like, yeah. what, what are you showing me? Totally. It was, uh, it was, I, the eyes glazed. And I think there was even a giggle, like I was the idiot. <laughs> yeah. no, that's fake. What are you showing me? <laughs> yeah, exactly. The, totally. Do you think, Sam, there's much of a variance difference or is, are there similarities, in fact, between defending like military systems, war zones or otherwise, and then coming into, really that shift in the corporate domain and protecting systems within the corporate sector? Yeah. Yeah. Like from a technical aspect, it's very much like the like. One thing that I've found is the organizational difference is that the private and public sectors are always, always changing and always evolving and always developing. There's not, there's nothing static. So where, you know, we'll come in to say in defense, we'd be able to plan an activity out. We do our full sort of assessment before we get into it. It's like getting the ground running and then building the plan as you're going. So I found that that, that momentum, um, is everywhere in private and public sector. And you've got to effectively do all this planning and development, um, you know, Whilst running BAU, you can't like pause everyone and do your planning and then go execute. You got to keep the lights on while growing and developing and enhancing. Yeah, nice, awesome. Ben, any other questions from you? No, I, I, I've just keep taking notes. I said to Gabe on the side here that I'm taking notes for for my future self because the trend path that you're on is the path that I certainly want to be on later in my career. So I've learned a lot in this episode, but I know there's probably something you want to ask us. As a last state, go. Oh, yeah. I just wanted to, I'm actually curious, Sam, do you plug into any key veteran and cyber communities at the moment? Any meetups? Uh, big network. Ben and I were talking about this just yesterday, actually. Yep. Lots of people we know coming out of defense and looking to pivot in, which is awesome. But then also in the industry, there's so many ex-defense people, which I think is awesome. You run into veterans all the time. You know, unfortunately, there's not as many engineers as signalers as uh, in the in the industry, but maybe we can change that in the future. It's just but, an um, intelligence thing, Gabe, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah that's what it is. <laughs> that's right, yeah. Look, day one selections. <laughs> <laughs> Specific criteria. <laughs> diversity, diversity. Um, but yeah, do you, do you plug into any communities at the moment? No, I'm bad. I should. Yeah. Um, I, I, I do, and I really want to do something like that. Um, 
like the New South Wales government has a veteran employees program. Yeah. Um, it's not geared towards cyber at the moment, but that's something that I really want to work with our New South, cyber New South Wales team to, to get into. Cause that's again, like you said, there's so many veterans that have spoken about the benefits and like the capability that all veterans bring into industry. It's just like a, a talent pool that we really need to tap and leverage. Yeah. Couldn't agree more. We just spun up our veterans group within Palo Alto Networks internally for FANZ, which is awesome. So we will start opening that up as well. Ben and I spoke about launching a meetup or something, connecting the industry and the like. And yeah, definitely let us know if you get something up and running in New South Wales, but even across the region too, I'm sure we can keep growing it and keep connecting. I hope yep. people transition, you know, catch up generally. It's, it's a really awesome community to be a part of. One thing I've come across as well, a lot of police, we're getting a lot of ex-police um, as well. And a paramilitary organization, similar concept, similar approach, similar mindset. They're another, you know, wealth of talent um, that, that we're seeing come through the cyber realms and putting them into practice. So um, again, I think that's something as well we can look at is how we build out, extend the veteran community into those other types of emergency services that are, that are doing a similar, a similar thing. Just a quick one for the listeners too. Uh, that's a great point, Sam. And if there are first responders and ex-military or transitioning, reach out to Gabe and myself on LinkedIn because we want to help. We want to make sure that you're supported in the transition and hopefully into the cybersecurity industry. So reach out on LinkedIn and we'll be there to help. Dark mode meetup. How good? Dark mode meetup. It's got to be dark, dark though. Dark mode. Duck meet up. <laughs> duck mode up. Duck mode. Duck mode bit. <laughs> Too good. Hey, Sam, thanks so much for joining us in Dark Mode. It's been really insightful. Looking forward to continue working with you, get you on another episode, and looking forward to supporting you on the sidelines in the new role at DCS. So thanks very much. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for having me, guys. It was awesome. Thanks, Sam.